Hi, everyone, and welcome to a presentation by the friends of Arlington's David M. Brown Planetarium. Delighted to have you join us this evening. And um, let me just explain who I am. I'm, I'm Alice Monet. I'm a member of the board of directors of the Friends of the Planetarium and uh, an astronomer, a retired astronomer, but once an astronomer, always an astronomer. Our speaker tonight is also a member of the board, and I'm very pleased to introduce Rafael Perino. And um, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about Rafael. Now, you will have seen his bio in the announcement, for, or if you didn't see it, it's there, and you can read all about his wonderful career. But I want to tell you about his earlier career with the planetarium. When Raphael was just six years old, his dad brought him to the planetarium for a family night. And apparently he made quite the impression on the director of the planetarium at that time and was welcomed back to greet visitors at the door and to count them as they entered the planetarium. I don't know what the child's labor laws would say about a six-year-old <laughs> working, but I don't think they paid him, so it was probably legal. Yeah. And, and he stuck around. So by 14, he was actually introducing shows in the planetarium. And um, years later, when the planetarium was uh, in need of ex an infusion of funds to keep it open, open and operating, Raphael was one of the founding members of our nonprofit organization. And that's when I got to know him. And he's been an, an invaluable member of the board, has done so much to Excellent. make our organization successful. And he continues doing it until tonight and beyond, I'm sure. <laughs> so without further ado, I'd like to introduce my friend, Raphael, for tonight's presentation. Thank you so much, Alice. And Alice didn't mention it here, but she was friend, uh, the Friends of the Planetarium president for many years. And uh, when we were working to save the planetarium uh, that little over 10 years ago now, um, she took the helm of that leadership position and uh, led us to victory. We, uh, we did save the planetarium and we're sustaining it now. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, absolutely happy to be here today. Um, I, I'll, uh, I think I have a couple charts here. I'll just run through real quick um, and then we'll um, we'll open it up to any questions that might be in the audience. Um, so, um, so yes, uh, what we'll be talking about this evening is the era of the space startups. Um, I'm sure you've seen throughout the news um, uh, many, many stories of um, uh, you know, Richard Branson's startups, of Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX, um, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, Blue Origin. Um, but in the background as well, and also really stimulated by uh, th those, those early entrants and those pioneers, um, there are many hundreds of other companies, uh, private companies that are thinking of every possible concept, uh, every possible use of a satellite, uh, every possible configuration of a launch vehicle or a rocket um, to be able to get those satellites up to space um, and really transforming, um, transforming the space industry. So if we go to the next chart, I'll uh, give a give an overview of some of the uh, the various trends. Uh, the uh, and we won't go in detail into all of these, but um, this uh, this is part of a, a series called the Startup Space Series. Uh, this is put out by uh, Bryce Bryce Tech. Um, Startup Space is available each year, uh, completely uh, publicly available. Um, what we're showing here. Um, is really growth. And you can really kind of tell in those first three charts that there's growth, but what does this growth mean? And, and you know, what, what, what's, what's at the root of all of this? In that first upper left chart, that's showing you what the mix of investors are over the past two decades or so. And so what are they investing in? Well, what Bryce was studying was investment in space startups. So you can see in those first few years, it kind of trickling in, that 2000 that represents some uh, big investments by uh, uh, Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin. Um, you see investments in SpaceX starting to trickle in as well. A few of the Google Lunar X Prize companies uh, begin to attract uh, some investment. Uh, Planet comes around in 2012 or so. Rocket Lab is in some of those early years as well. 
uh, by around 2013, they've uh, started to develop their uh, launch vehicle. Um, and then you really see a flood. And it's, it's really through the success of some of those early space startups that you started to see a flood of investment occurring, uh, really going from something in the 2000s where it was a couple hundred million dollars had been invested um, every couple of years in space startups. That ended up absolutely um, booming. 2015, we saw more investment, so it's excluding debt financing. You will see that big uh, uh, purple um, uh, bar in 2010. So excluding debt finance, which is a different type of investment. Uh, venture capital, we saw more investment in space startups in 2015 than in all the years prior, reaching all the way back to 2000. So there was a real uh, massive spike that occurred. Um, that has continued. Um, and as you see in 2019, and th this study doesn't include 2020, nor does it include the, the stats from 2021, um, but 2020 uh, even dwarfed 2019 and 2021 is positioned to dwarf uh, 2020 as well. So what all of this means is that you're seeing uh, really tens of billions of dollars, upwards of right now around between 35 and $40 billion that's been invested in space startups really since about 2012. There was, uh, you can see that there's a bit of investment prior to that, uh, but there's a real boom that's occurred in the past few years. And so this has led to a whole preponderance, a wonderful proliferation of, uh, of different business ideas, uh, different concepts, different ways of using what we call small satellites and, and finding different innovative ways to be able to get those up to orbit. So I was reading through a, a Morgan Stanley report recently. They made an interesting parallel here, and this kind of helps to explain this, what we're seeing here. Morgan Stanley looked at uh, kind of enabling technologies and how they can end up really uh, creating a kind of that, that massive uh, growth effect, unanticipated sometimes. They had mentioned that uh, there's an innovator by the name of Elijah Otis. Elijah Otis back in 1853 developed the, the safety elevator and so at the time, it was considered the intriguing technology, um, and, uh, and you know it was certainly innovative. It enabled for a lot of um, just safer lift of materials. What really could not have been anticipated at the time was that within about 20 years, all the major cities in the United States had skyscrapers, and those skyscrapers are very much enabled by those elevators that had safety mechanisms built in. So similarly, if one looks at the advent of small satellites, which really uh, NASA and other research um, entities, organizations, and agencies really pioneered um, in the late 90s and early 2000s really came to the fore as an option to be able to do real science, to be able to do real experimentation and real commerce. Um, and so as the technology miniaturized, um, there was also the, so that, that, that helped to increase the, the supply of, uh, or at least we could say the demand, the, the demand for those satellites to go up to orbit. And in response, um, there were a lot of launch companies that wanted to help uh, to supply launch vehicles to be able to get those satellites up to space. So it's that combination of the reduction in the size of the satellites with the decrease, with the with the increase in the number of launch vehicles, and really um, the, the driving down of the cost of launch that is the great innovation that has enabled for this boom to occur. Um, Moving uh, along here and, and skipping over to the bottom, you can see the number of companies that have been founded year over year. Again, those first that first decade or so, it's a few space startups a year being uh, be, uh, you know, being founded. In the past uh, handful of years, really the past uh, you know, five to 10 years, you're seeing upwards of 30 to 40, 50 uh, companies a year that are being founded. You see a slight drop off in those latter years there. Those will probably increase in the next year or two. These are companies that haven't attracted financing yet. Um, and so those numbers typically increase year over year. Um, and what you see in the lower corner um, is just a, kind of the concentration of, uh, of, of, of companies, or, or see this as investors in space startups um, headquartered in those uh, uh, headquartered in those countries. So it does show that it's very much a global um, effort, a lot of a lot of concentration in the United States um, and, and throughout Europe and, and uh, in Asia, um, and increasingly uh, non-U.S. Uh, countries uh, seeing investments in space startups. So I spent a little bit more time in the start than, uh, than planned, but there's a lot of uh, juicy data to go through here. So um, let's go over to the, uh, the next chart. So Space Capital, another organization that's tracking um, uh, venture capital, angel investment, private equity. Um, these are all uh, different uh, ways of funding companies. And these are all 
typically different types of organizations, but not exclusively, that are that are funding those companies. Uh, Space Capital provides a dashboard uh, that enables uh, enables you to really be able to dive in uh, to the different types of uh, companies that are being invested in. They split it up by infrastructure, distribution, and applications. You'll see on this chart in the next are infrastructure and distribution. Infrastructure is going to include those companies with around $33 billion of investment since 2012. It's going to include those companies such as uh, satellite companies, uh, launch companies, Earth observation companies, um, and, and the like. And if we switch to the next chart, you'll see uh, that this is a, more of a focus on, on distribution of those uh, those applications. So in the in, in the space industry, we really tend to split things into, into two, at least in commerce. You have upstream and downstream. Uh, services. So those uh, those services that are upstream, are, uh, a lot of times can be launch companies that are providing capabilities to get assets, get satellites up on orbit. Downstream is the application of the data that's being collected by those satellites on orbit observing the planet. So if we go to the next chart, um, what this will illustrate here is is really uh, it, it just shows you the the absolute prol proliferation of companies. A lot of these companies founded just within the past five to ten years. Uh, some of them even sooner, uh, more recent. Um, it really splits out into a couple different sectors. But what what we're seeing here really though is uh, is a focus on uh, satellite companies. There are no launch companies in here, at least not that I have seen. Uh, the focus is on constellations. So constellations are. Or uh, clusters of satellites. Sometimes constellations can be you know, kind of a few satellites, you know, five, 10, 15 satellites. Sometimes it's thousands of satellites. Um, and you know, th there are companies such as uh, SpaceX um, and, and OneWeb and Telesat uh, that are in combination planning to launch more satellites in the next decade than have been launched in the past 50 to 60 years total. Um, so there's a real shift occurring, whereas uh, over those past 50 to 60 years, it was primarily um, government uh, payloads um, and, and then you know, education and pathfinders um, or those are te te technical demonstration satellites were really shifting to the era of uh, all of these different types of satellites by commercial companies trying to do business in space with commercial customer customers and government customers on Earth. So if we shift to the next chart, this is my uh, last chart here. Uh, this splits it out a little bit more, and as you can see, that there's kind of that, um, that, that divide between upstream and downstream. Um, and uh, the upstream companies, as you can see, is also uh, there's also quite a proliferation of companies there. Um, this is only a, a subset of the companies that are actually out there. When you look at the, the there are some studies that are being done um, that are continuously done uh, that track the number of launch companies, space startup launch companies out there. It's on the order of 150 to 200. I've heard higher numbers as well. That doesn't mean that all those companies will be successful, but it does mean that those companies uh, have attracted angel investment or or venture capital, and some of them have even um, reached the point where they've uh, exited, which is always the goal of a venture capitalist or angel investor. You always want to see an exit. That means that uh, their investment had a return. Um, it's, it's often been uh, quoted that uh, it was a Harvard business study uh, in which they say that three out of four VC firms or VC backed firms fail. Um, whether that is going to extend into the space startup sector is still to be seen, um, but uh, there certainly have been some failures along the way. Uh, but there are a few companies that have failed that have liquidated and reassembled and reimagined their uh, their, their, their business case. Uh, so that's kind of an overview of, of you know, the, really the past 20 years of what's been happening in terms of uh, investment, in terms of the different types of companies out there. Um, happy to take uh, all of your questions. Um, and. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Alice. <laughs> oh, I think you might be on mute, Alice. I had no idea there were so many companies getting into the space business. Holy oh, cow. Yeah. yeah, it's more companies than, than were shown there. I always like that constellation map and that, uh, that ecosystem map just kind of helps, helps remind me. Um, the, the diversity of ideas out there and all the folks that are putting it all on the line to make successful businesses and bring lots of cool services back down to the earth. Well, I don't see any questions at the moment, so I'm going to hop in and ask my own, uh, if you okay. don't mind. Um, yeah. I'm just curious. I really don't know the answer to this. Um, what is the t typical dwell time or, or orbit duration 
for these satellites. I imagine it's it's a broad spectrum. Yeah. Some will stay up a long time, some a short time, but but typically are they permanent or just uh, doing a job and being deorbited? Yeah, this is a great question. It gets down to kind of the uh, kind of the code of conduct up there. A lot of the different ideas about uh, how we deorbit things, um, of responsibility of companies uh, that, that put uh, assets up there on orbit. Um, you know, there, it really depends on the the orbit that you're targeting. If you're sending something up to the altitude of you know a couple hundred kilometers, we're talking about maybe satellites from Planet or Spire. Those are some of the pioneers. Uh, of the space startup boom, and they've been around for some time now, or, or uh, you know, very well along in their business cases. Um, they've put up several hundred satellites, but typically they deorbit within about two to three years, naturally, um, just by the uh, the drag, the atmospheric drag um, that occurs with these satellites. Um, each of them being tracked uh, very carefully, and there, every satellite that's going up um, needs to be registered um, yeah, with the, uh, the FCC, um, and various entities are tracking them. Um, and then there are space startups that are looking to track as well. And there are space startups that are looking to remove uh, debris and remove inactive and dead satellites on orbit. So it's kind of this ecosystem that's uh, working with itself to, um, to 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 make it ultimately a more sustainable environment. But yeah, th those those satellites that are kind of in, in that low Earth orbit, um, within a couple of years, they would deorbit. As you get further up into the uh, mid and higher altitudes, um, getting you know, uh, you know, fives and tens of thousands of kilometers up, then the geostationary, um, you know, you're out to about 37,000, 40,000 uh, kilometers or so. At yeah. that point, at that point, um, if you don't have the propulsion on your satellite, be able to put it in what we call a graveyard orbit, which would be a responsible orbit that would keep it up there for hundreds of thousands or millions of years, um, then it could end up being a debris problem. Um, so it's always important the further, particularly the further you get out, and the more more um, if there are more conjunctions potential uh, or possible in your orbit, the more important it is that your satellite has some sort of onboard propulsion. But some of those satellites in low Earth orbit they don't have onboard propulsion, but it's really kind of a guarantee, uh, just based on the atmosphere drag that they will come down within a couple of years. So not a big problem. But again, for those satellites that are further out, we're talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of years for those to actually naturally deorbit. Wow. Uh, there's a question here uh, from yeah. Kathy. Um, actually, there's, yeah, there's one on the screen, but there's, Kathy was first. Her question is, do you think the impact on astronomy of Starlink and other satellite constellations will lead to greater international regulation? And how true is it that companies like SpaceX can pretty much do what they want once the payloads are in orbit? These are good questions, and I, I will try to address them as, as well as I can. Um, you know, during the, uh, let's, I'm trying to think, this would have been Horizon 2020, um, not Horizon 2020, it's, it's a European uh, investment fund. Uh, the, and Alice, you and I were at, that, were at that press release. This was the decadal survey in 2020 yes. when uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson was speaking. It was a lot of 20, fun. Yeah, yeah 2020, 2020, that's right. Um, and I remember, uh, with all the satellite systems that were proposed, this was at such an early stage in the space startup boom that I don't remember that mitigation factors and and and, and planning for ground-based telescopes outside of atmospheric aberrations. And you can certainly have a, a mirror that kind of deforms itself to be able to handle you know, the, the aberrations of the Earth's atmosphere to be able to observe an object more more carefully um, and, and more uh, over a long period of time. Um, but the idea of there being more than a couple thousand satellites up at the time. There were only about a thousand or, or maybe 1,500 active satellites on orbit. Now we're talking about you know, upwards of about 3,000 or so on orbit. And within the next decade, uh, we're talking about over 10,000 satellites on orbit um, continuously being replenished. Um, and so you'll probably either see 10,000 or more uh, kind of continuously, uh, unless the business cases uh, lead to it, you know, making business sense to have even more up on orbit. Each of these satellites has to be registered through um, through you know, through international and national entities uh, so that they can be tracked. Um, there are certainly liabilities associated with um, assets that are being placed up there through the uh, Outer Space Treaty, 1967. Um, there's a lot of interest in ensuring that whatever is going up there, that companies are accountable for it. Or really more accurately, that the member states, the launching states, where those companies launched from are accountable for it. Um, and so 
the other side of this outside of the, really the regulation is kind of the self-regulation uh, that commercial companies uh, will need to take um, take part in. That if you're looking to put a mega constellation up there, let's say you know, a couple hundred or a thousand or more satellites, it makes good business sense for you to have a sustainable environment environment on orbit. You want to ensure that your orbit is safe so that the satellites that cost multiple millions of dollars and the launches that you spent tens of millions or maybe quarter billion dollars to send up there are safe. Um, yeah. So it makes a lot of business sense for those those environments to be safe. And interestingly enough, companies such as SpaceX and OneWeb are some of the most vocal advocates for space sustainability. Um, and uh, I, I find that to be, um, it makes a lot of business sense that you, you want to make sure you're protecting your assets up there. From an astronomical standpoint, and this gets back to the decadal survey of 2010, and, and really the current and future decadal surveys, um, I think what will have to be factored in is the impact on astronomy of these uh, mega constellations that are up there. Um, that astronomers are observing clusters of Starlink satellites and of OneWeb satellites that are up there. And as these other space startups are successful, you'll see other variants of satellites up there, as well as the other constellations I was talking about. In the aggregate, we're talking about tens of thousands of satellites. Um, and so I've been reading on this a bit. This uh, you know, the 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 kind of the, the mitigation side of it is a little bit outside of my expertise. But from what I've what I've read um, in some recent uh, recent publications, um, Starlink. I know SpaceX is working to uh, reorient the satellites. They're working to darken parts of the satellites, which mitigated a bit. Um, other mitigation techniques I've seen have been to ensure that these objects are extremely well tracked. Now for the larger satellites and for really responsible actors, these will be well tracked. They'll be tracked uh, you know, by, by, by uh, commercial and government entities continuously. I mean, there are entities such as AGI that are and, and uh, LeoSat, not LeoSat. Um, well, let's get back to the, the, the other company that I'm thinking of right now. Uh, but there are companies that are, are looking to track very continuously um, you know, hundreds of thousands of objects continuously around the planet. So the more that that information can get into the hands of astronomers who are conducting observational astronomy, whether it be uh, observational astronomy from a backyard and they're trying to do you know, studies of variable stars over time, um, and they need to have a, a, a clear view of the stars they're studying, uh, or whether it be a major observatory, such as the observatories in, in, in the Atacama or in the uh, in, in uh, Mauna Kea, um, they're going to want to have some predictability as to what's up there. If they know there's going to be a transit of several satellites across the area that they're observing, which is really very likely a pinpoint in the sky, um, they're going to they're want to have some predictability to be able to organize their observations around that. Um, and uh, so I think that's the, that's the way to go about it initially. I think that um, yeah, really through great tracking, great communication, and through mitigation efforts on the satellites themselves, I think that astronomy and, and, and mega constellation commerce can, um, can can work work well work well together and provide a lot of the, the great services and a lot of the phenomenal astronomy research that'll that'll come out of these uh, these efforts. Great. Now I saw here's a question. Can you see it, Raphael, from Jennifer? Yeah, absolutely. An example of a successful, or so, uh, I'll read it back, although I think everybody can see it here. Um, example of a successful startup, a failed startup, and a reimagined use case. All right, so um, an example of a successful startup, um, I would say that really um, yeah, th there have been quite a few, and it's really been heartening because it, when, when you, you know, in the aerospace conferences, and the, the space startup conferences I was attending, you know, even just a few years ago, You'd have venture capitalists, um, you know, private equity folks, uh, investment bankers and analysts up there saying, we've seen tens of billions invested into these companies, but where are the exits? We're not seeing exits. We're seeing one or two, but where are the exits? And as a VC, your bread and butter is to make sure that your companies are exiting. Now, I the, the idea being that if you've invested in 10 companies and one of them really pans out and you see a 10x return, or 7 or 10, 8x return, it makes up for all the other failures in general. Uh, so they're looking for about one in 10. Um, you know, and, and so that kind of varies from as you get into higher echelons of investment, you get into private equity investment banks. Um, but, uh, but, but ultimately, they're looking for a return. And in the past year or two, maybe past two or three years, we really are starting to see those, those exits, occur, exits occurring, whether it be through merger or acquisition activity or through this, uh, th th there's a there's a vehicle out there right now. It's a, this is a, an, an investment vehicle uh, called a, a special 
purpose acquisition company. It's called SPACs. And they've been around since the 90s, 80s and 90s. It's, uh, it, it's not a new technology, uh, or it's not, not really a new instrument, I should say. Um, but ultimately, it was, uh, it was used uh, during those times to really help to fund those companies that perhaps had slightly more uh, speculative business cases um, and, and, and provide them the capital, that high-risk capital that could lead to great reward. And the idea was to be able to take those companies public by merging them um, with, with another company. You kind of create a shell company that merges with another company that goes onto the onto the public markets. A different path from an initial pu public offering or an IPO. Uh, but I, I'm digressing a little bit here. But the, the point here is that um, there have been a few companies that have been very, very successful and have seen spec mergers. Virgin Galactic was the first space company um, to successfully uh, do one of these SPAC mergers. So back in 2019, um, they are on the public markets now and their original investors uh, certainly saw a return uh, due to that SPAC transaction. Uh, Rocket Lab, um, uh, Arkit, um, let's see who else has, has done it recently, Spire. Uh, they're also in the, in the process of, uh, of, a, of a SPAC uh, merger, uh, Momentus, um, AST uh, uh, Science is also in the process of it. So you're seeing companies that are um, really joining the the flood of SPAC mergers. SPAC, this is kind of the uh, the financial instrument du jour, really. Um, if you were to look at uh, Wall Street Journal and, and Financial Times articles on this vehicle, you're seeing that there's a real a, a real boom in the use of it over the past uh, couple years or so. Whereas space companies, they comprise about six percent of all uh, SPAC transactions. Um, so it's, it's just kind of a, it's a fragment of it, um, but it is uh, it's becoming a great way for those early VCs who really took a bet, uh, which any VC does. But um, space is uh, is um, there's a lot of risk in any 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 given space system. So um, it's good to do your due diligence, understand the business case, understand that competition, understand that market, um, and then uh, and then invest invest accordingly. Um, so for them to see those in, those investment returns, I'm sure a lot of VCs are really happy. Um, to see this happening. So yeah, you're seeing, seeing some very successful returns there. There are companies that are generating revenue right now uh, in, in that space startup ecosystem. Um, and so that that would really be considered a success as well. Um, not quite at IPO level or at merger acquisition level, but they're certainly uh, trending towards it. Jennifer, you had also asked about a, a failed space startup. Um, so um, we look at, uh, there, there have been a couple of launch companies um, that by failure, I, I guess the definition there being that uh, you know, they filed for Chapter 11 um, and uh, and declared bankruptcy and perhaps liquidated. Um, uh, Firefly Space Systems, this did happen to them about four or five years ago. Um, this also happened um, with XCore. This was a suborbital tourism company. Uh, Firefly was a launch company. Um, and uh, and in the case of XCore, I don't, I don't believe that they've... Uh, uh, they, they have responded to produce something new. I, I could be incorrect. And if anybody knows, otherwise I'd be really interested to know more about. Um, I know that with Firefly, their assets were liquidated. They were bought up and they have been reimagined as Firefly Aerospace. Firefly is getting pretty close to launching with their alpha launch vehicle. Uh, they're um, based out of, I believe, Austin, Texas. And they're planning to launch out of Vandenberg uh, Space uh, Force Space in California uh, this year. Um, so so that, that's an example of a company that's been reimagined. Yeah, go ahead, Nelson. I understand from Kathy that there are some more questions stacking up. I don't see them, but maybe she can show them to us. And they Here may be in the comments section. Oh yeah, good call. Yeah. Hey, Steve. Um, all right. So, uh, what effect or what what effect will the seeming interest of the U.S. military and Starship have on the long run of the commercial sector? Okay. This is a good point. Um, a good point within a, embedded within a question. Um, we did see over those first, um, really over the past decade or so, a lot of interest in, in private investors. And that, that was a boom in and of itself. Really within the past few years as well, uh, the US government has become much, much more of an anchor customer. Now SpaceX certainly benefited from the, uh, the CCI cap and the CCT cap, uh, commercial crew and commercial uh, cargo contracts, as did other commercial companies. Um, I believe, orbital ATK, Boeing. Um, and, and so uh, that is provided, uh, having an anchor customer helps you as a startup because it enables kind of a steady flow of capital um, and enables you to be able to really broaden your operations and then go on to demonstrate and attract more capital from, from private investors and then get the revenue and the exit and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, but um, yes, US government and really European governments too 
um, and, 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 and governments throughout Asia are looking to be uh, more of customers for these, these space startups. Uh, Steve, you mentioned um, Starship. Um, so uh, Starship is certainly, uh, the, the concept there is to be able to provide a super heavy lift uh, capability uh, on the order of shuttle or, or, or heavier, really. Um, I don't know the exact metric ton class of it, but I know we're talking probably in that 20,000 uh, kilogram plus class. And if any of my colleagues are watching and they're looking at uh, metrics in Starship and they're saying, oh, Raphael, it's 30,000. Well, you're, you're probably right. Uh, so I'm just trying to remember. Uh, but this is a heavy lift vehicle, much, much heavier lift than the Falcon 9, um, which was the, really the workhorse of SpaceX. Uh, and the idea for both of these vehicles is to be able to launch and to land. And recently in a test, uh, Starship nailed it. They were able to land it. And I think everybody in the space industry just kind of applauded. Uh, SpaceX has really been leading the way throughout this industry for a very long time and was uh, one of the real early success stories uh, in the industry. And so um, uh, it's really awesome what they've done. Um, and I know that the US government is certainly interested in being able to get people and payloads um, up to orbit for less money uh, and, and 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 really quickly, and uh, and so they've been leveraging the commercial sector more and more and more, uh, and particularly these space startups. Um, so uh, it's it's a really extraordinarily exciting time um, you know, for space startups, and it's a great opportunity for government uh, to be able to leverage the the efficiencies of the commercial sector uh, to be able to do science, get stuff up there to do science, um, and to be able to get. Um, you know, to be able to, to build out the space industry. Are there more questions? Here we go. Yeah, we're, so we're starting to see, um, we're starting to see a, a really an interest, what we, we call MODs. So these are ministries of defense. So it's not just DOD that's looking to um, what they call disaggregate. It's been the, the kind of the term over the past decade or so, as opposed to um, having a, a big, juicy billion or multi-billion dollar target that took 20 years to develop, exquisite instrumentation that's up there and can do everything you want, everything you possibly want. Instead, if you could spread that capability over multiple satellites, a constellation of satellites even, it increases the resilience of that system. It's very, very attractive to DOD and really to other militaries around the planet. So MODs around the planet are looking at um, at leveraging commercial industry, we're seeing this uh, in Europe, uh, in particular, um, and we're seeing this uh, in, in other countries, uh, other continents and countries as well. Um, yeah, keep, keep an eye out for that because there's there is definitely um, an expansion um, beyond just those co commercial customers. Um, I shouldn't just say just commercial commercial customers. Everybody's really extremely important here, um, but it's uh, it's broadening. Um, so yeah, de definitely interest among among other government entities outside the United States. Well, um, and thanks for that question, uh, Denise. Um, so uh, ultimately, um, you know, one of the one of the key ways uh, to be able to, to get these objects into space is really through through launch. So if you're actually talking about physical assets that you're trying to get up to space, um, you have uh, really a, a broad array of operational vehicles and then uh, rockets, and uh, you have those that are about to come online. You have those that are existing, um, and uh, and so so to be able to get to be able to get those assets up into space, a, a rocket is going to be um, you know, your best way to do it. Well, it, it, in in kind of science fiction, or uh, not so much science fiction, but really concepts, their ideas of of space elevators and being able to connect um, between space and Earth, be able to send payloads up and down um, you know, to, to space. Uh, back down to Earth, but um, that has not quite come to fruition yet. Uh, but some would argue that those those launch vehicles that are reusable, that are sending things up to space, and then the rocket comes back down and the engines come back down safely, that in a certain sense is kind of like a space elevator. Um, it's just that there's not a there's not a, a an elevator shaft of sor sorts that goes all the way up to space. Instead, it's it's parts of the vehicle to bring things back down to uh, from space down to Earth. Um, certainly can send plenty of data up to space. So if you're working in photons, um, you can send things up to satellites and data up to satellites. Uh, certainly all of our uh, missions that have really ever been sent out to the outer planets or sent out to the moon, uh, we've sent data uh, back and forth to those, uh, those satellites. And uh, I think there's a, a project called the Breakthrough Project uh, and uh, funded by Yuri Milner, um, which they put about $100 million into a project where they plan to uh, fire a laser beam at uh, 
uh, really tiny, tiny satellites. I can't remember the scale of them, but they're infinitesimal. Um, and you would use that beam of energy to be able to propel um, what would ultimately be uh, these solar sails off into space. I believe they're solar sails. It's slightly out of my depth right now. Um, but uh, there are all sorts of different ways to send uh, 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 objects and, of course, people um, and, and, and data up into space. Good question, uh, Steve. So uh, Ariane, uh, so Ariane selected, um, or Ariane was selected by NASA. Uh, let's see, it's probably would have been around 2000. I don't know exactly when launch vehicle selection occurred for the Webb Telescope. It was probably between about 2005 and 2010. In all likelihood, that's when the the, the project was kind of. It, I think it had passed development. It was probably around Phase B, which is typically when NASA tends to um, ten, tends to select its launch vehicles. Um, Phase B, Phase C, or somewhere around there. Um, so, so ultimately, Ariane at the time was one of the most reliable launch vehicles on the market. But more importantly, uh, the Ariane Five um, also had the heavy lift capability to be able to launch um, the James Webb Space Telescope uh, to roughly uh, a million uh, miles away from the uh, the surface of the Earth. So it's going to go out to L2 orbit, and it'll be operational for about ten years or so. Um, and, uh, and and ultimately, the, the reason it, the reason Ariane selected, or the re, sorry, the reason NASA selected Ariane uh, was really the reliability, um, and it was the uh, it was the lift capability. So Jennifer asked, uh, please tell us more about ABL space systems and their goals. Um, before I do so, and I probably should have started off with this, all views are my own. Uh, none of my views are the views of ABL Space Systems. Um, so I, I, I currently um, uh, work as a business development manager at ABL Space Systems. Uh, ABL is looking to uh, launch payloads into orbit. Um, we're targeting about 1,000 kilograms um, up to a 500 kilometer uh, sun synchronous orbit. Sun synchronous is a very popular orbit. A lot of satellite operators like to operate there. It kind of keeps you on one side of the uh, kind of uh, sun facing, uh, and you can do a lot of your tech demos and uh, Earth observation from there. Um, and, uh, and and ultimately, we're looking to launch uh, this year, uh, which is really exciting. Um, not saying anything that hasn't been in uh, public pu publications uh, recently, uh, but uh, we're definitely tracking towards it. Uh, a lot of exciting tests of systems. Um, and uh, we are certainly one of, uh, I would say, really a handful of companies that are um, either uh, very close to launch or, or operational already. Um, so yeah, ABL, um, it, we're, we're, we're looking to launch the space. I think that the, the real innovative piece here is that uh, we're not looking to reinvent the wheel. I think that our approach really um, is to keep, to maintain a very simple uh, architecture. It's really that elegance and that simplicity. Uh, to really build off of uh, legacy systems um, so that you can really pr uh, really scale your production um, you know, rapidly um, and keep costs down. Um, a really novel, uh, more, more novel systems will, will uh, incur uh, larger development costs for investors and potentially larger costs for customers. Uh, so the, the, the target here is to be efficient, scale rapidly, work off of proven technology, um, and in our case, we also are able to containerize our solutions. So uh, the idea here is to be able to uh, fit the entire launch vehicle um, into uh, uh, really shipping containers. So you can go anywhere on the planet or be able to ship anywhere in the country. Uh, as long as we have a, a really uh, a space to be able to launch, uh, we can set up with a kind of a minimal footprint um, and be able to, to, um, to, to launch our vehicle from where we're licensed to launch from. That's a good question. And, and, yeah, we it's part, read, good we point. Yeah. These questions. <laughs> yeah. So we got a question. Is Firefly named after the TV show, which is an amazing TV series? If nobody has ever seen Firefly before, uh, on this on this uh, this uh, webinar, definitely recommend it. And uh, clearly, uh, the, the person who asked this question has seen Firefly before. Kind of a space cowboy cowgirl type of epic science fiction and fantasy it's a it's a mixture of a lot of interesting things big fan of firefly it's only one season which is a real bummer and hopefully it gets brought back someday but uh, i think every firefly fan says that um anyway so i i would imagine that mark cusick who's the ceo of firefly was a fan of the show um but uh, I do not know the origin story for the, the name of, uh, of Firefly Aerospace and prior to that, Firefly Space Systems. But it's probably, probably a pretty good guess that uh, that's what they're named after. Uh, 
So we need to read these questions out loud. Yeah, in, in today's contentious geopolitical environment, how does the private sector successfully cooperate with, with nations such as uh, China and Russia? Um, so this is, yeah, this is a great question. Um, yeah, to be able to, so r right now we, uh, with the International Space Station, Russia has been a long-term partner. And for many years between 2011 when Shuttle was retired and just last year when we saw the first um, launch uh, of humans from U.S. soil uh, since 2011, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Russian government and, and Roscosmos uh, was our ride to space. It enabled our U.S. astronauts to be able to get to the International Space Station. So uh, Roscosmos and Russia are an absolutely critical partner um, and really have been a steadfast partner. Uh, we've been working uh, with the Russians uh, in space uh, from a civil space level um, really since the uh, this is the 1970s. The uh, I, Alice, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Apollo Soyuz test project, I believe, it was 1975. Um, mm -hmm. where we had that handshake, um, and uh, we've been working with them uh, you know, even more closely um, yeah, with the International Space Station in the 1990s and all of the uh, negotiations that were necessary. Uh, but we have other partners. Uh, NASA has other partners, um, in, including the Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency. Uh, the Japanese space agency, um, uh, JAXA, and of course, uh, Roscosmos. I don't believe I missed any space agencies, and my apologies if I did. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, th th these are all um, space agencies that have been you know, great partners uh, in a, what is ultimately a very, very successful uh, program. That is the International Space Station. Um, it's enabled a lot of research, a lot of uh, uh, bio biological research, human research. Um, space Station is also really, um, well, well, it may not get spoken about so often um, you know, uh, outside of outside of the agency or outside of um, kind of the space industry proper. It's really enabled kind of a toehold, um, kind of a, a, a jumping point, an anchor um, for a lot of commercial companies. Um, you know, the the development of, uh, of Falcon Heavy, uh, the development of, of, of NanoRacks, other companies that have made use uh, of uh, uh, other companies that, that have really made use of the International Space Station, either through the cargo they've sent up to it, or the, uh, for example, there is a uh, there's a, an airlock on the Japanese capsule um, or, uh, of the International Space Station where satellites are deployed to low Earth orbit. So that's happening from the International Space Station. Um, so it's it's been a great test bed. It's been a great source for bi biological research, really for long term too. Such as Scott Kelly, who spent uh, upwards of a year up there. Um, it's it's been very successful in that regard, and the hope is that it, it exists for a while longer here, and that it really I think NASA is looking to be able to hand off the ISS um, to, uh, to to commercial uh, entities uh, to be able to to manage operations up there and 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 really be able to to find a, find great business cases for working in a microgravity environment, which brings me to space tourism right. and suborbital tourism. So Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic are also looking to uh, help. You know, scientists and commercial companies, as well as tourists who really just love space, to be able to get into a microgravity environment and be able to test things, uh, you know, t test experiments, you know, humans actually physically working with experiments um, you know, in, in an environment that really simulates space. Um, and in, in the case of, of, of VG and, and uh, Blue Origin and Blue, uh, they really are getting up to the right to the edge or surpassing the Kármán line. Um, it's kind of the debated line for the edge of space. Um, but hopefully that answers the question there. There's a lot of partnership, certainly, um, with, with various countries. I know that in the case of China, it's, it's, a, it's much more limited. Um, there are a lot of, um, a lot of geo, geo, geopolitical um, restrictions on, on collaborating. Um, with, with, uh, with with the, the Chinese Space Agency, so um, and that, that really gets into what we call ITAR, um, and I'm not going to remember that acronym right now. I've read on it so many times. With International Trade. No, I'm not going to remember. Never mind. Uh, so ITAR basically these are a series of restrictions in which you're really not supposed to transfer any technologies um, to, uh, to to selected uh, uh, non-U.S. entities, um, and uh, so that. that that, that gets into kind of the geopolitics of it. That there are certain systems, and this really gets back to the early Cold War, um, when the United States and the Soviet Union were developing space technologies. Those same technologies uh, to be able to send a rocket up to space and precision guide it down to a specific location uh, to have people land uh, uh, are the same technologies that were used for nuclear missiles uh, back in 
back in the, the 60s and the 70s. Um, so there's always what we call uh, dual use, dual use uh, applications um, for space technology. So yeah, the United States is very, very careful about the um, about those dual use technologies. Hopefully that answered the question. I kind of went off on a tangent a bit. Oh, thank you, Alice. International traffic in ARNs regulations. My space law professor from GW, if he sees this, he won't be happy that I didn't remember ITAR, but he was a great professor. So many acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of acronyms, yeah. So I think that might be it for questions. Alice, did you have any other questions? Well, I, I was struck by the news this past week that Jeff Bezos is planning to um, travel into space uh, yeah, on exciting. his own Blue Origin spacecraft. Um, and I, I suppose it's a silly question, but what are the risks involved? I mean, he's, this is, I mean, he's really putting himself on the line. And um, Well, I mean, uh, you know, guys like Bezos, Branson, Musk, these are risk takers inherently. Hmm. These are folks that would put hundreds, millions, in the case of Bezos, billions of dollars of investment into companies that weren't necessarily a sure thing. You know, SpaceX um, had quite a few pretty high profile failures in its early years, and Musk was putting everything he could into that. There's a really great book called Liftoff by Eric Berger that just came out. I really recommend that. It gets into that backstory. Space Barons is another great book by um, the Washington Post reporter Christian Davenport. I really recommend that one. It really gets into some of those those early stories, some of those early concepts uh, for ways to get um, uh, uh, payloads up to space, and uh, really the trials and tribulations of those companies early on. Um, so the, the question here being, uh, what's the risk to, to Jeff Bezos? Um, New Shepard, uh, which is the vehicle they'll be going on, uh, has launched up to about 100, and, 100 to 110 kilometers and then landed. I think they've done this about 12 or 13 times. I may I may have that wrong. It, it's it, it, They've done it a fair number of times where I think they've bought down a lot of the risk associated with it. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they're really planning to be able to open this up to commercial customers very soon, really as of this summer. Um, mm -hmm. I think to, to have the founder of that company uh, you know, be one of the passengers on that flight is really symbolic. It's really a, um, it really shows a trust in that system. It really shows a respect for the customers um, who are looking to fly uh, on those uh, on those those New Shepard flights and on future uh, vehicles that, uh, that 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 Blue may have in in mind. And you know, Sir Richard Branson is planning the same thing. Sir Richard Branson is planning to plan one of those first commercial flights. I'm not sure if it's the exact first commercial flight uh, of the. Uh, uh, spaceship too, uh, but he'll be up there as well. These are risk takers. These are folks that you know, b believe in their engineers and and, and or you know, they're they're dreamers. These are folks who absolutely love the space industry. Folks who made this is you know, I've seen this written a few times. It, there are those who grew up with Apollo. They saw the soaring vision of the uh, of the early space age. Um, and then, in a certain sense, saw us kind of retreat um, back to low Earth orbit, out of deep space, off the surface of the moon. And microelectronics boomed, software and technology and computers boomed, and they made their billions off tech. They made their billions off of entrepreneurship, particularly in the case of Branson, has dozens of companies that he uh, has uh, founded successfully. Um, and in the case of uh, Elon Musk, I think he was one of the co-founders of PayPal. Um, and, uh, and and so these are folks who made made their made their billions um, you know, outside of space, but always had an eye for space, and were always kind of they, they dreamed of being able to do some sort of work in space. Uh, mm -hmm. And so now those soaring visions that you see of landing landing boots on Mars, or of of uh, Bezos's dream of having millions of people working and living in space. These are, these are multi-century type visions. Um, so in a certain sense, it makes a lot of sense that these founders are, are putting everything on the line, putting their lives on the line 
uh, to prove out these systems, to prove it to customers. It's a really exciting time. I, I, you can probably tell by my expression, but it, it, it's, it's pretty awesome what the industry is going through right now. So a follow up to the previous question, how does science navigate around government policies? Does the scientific community unify regardless of politics? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> How does science navigate government policies to scientifically unify? Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, you know, I, I think the saying goes that mathematics is the universal language. Um, science, in a certain sense, is as well. And mathematics is just the, the physical uh, explanation of the cosmos. Um, so when you get down to it, the, the science that's being done by different space agencies and acad academic institutions and uh, commercial organizations around the planet, um, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the goals come down to some of the same questions of who are we, where did we come from, um, you know, what's the size and age of the cosmos, as Sagan used to say, um, and, and, and how can we how can we find a way to be able to expand humans, humanity's footprint further and further out into the into the cosmos to explore it? Um, I think I, I may have run a bit afar of the, the question itself. Is it in the comment section? Yeah, I think it is. I see. Oh, oh thank you, uh, Kathy. Um, or that might have been Alice. Um, yeah, I think that answers it. I think that, that, that there are fundamental questions that are asked in science that across um, across really all cultures and across uh, all different governments and, and civilization, you know, it's it's uh, it's 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 fundamental what we're be, what's being asked. Can you talk a little about the Artemis Accords? Yeah, yeah, uh, I can talk a little bit on it, not at length, because this is something that really is um, uh, still really developing. Uh, there have been ideas that have been proposed. We've seen um, multiple signatories. Um, to these accords, uh, and, and Steve, you may be more, more familiar than I than all the countries that have signed on so far, but it is a few countries that have that have signed on to the concept. And the idea here is to really have um, a kind of rules of the road in a certain sense um, as we begin to conduct lunar exploration, which really many would argue, and I, I would agree, is the next logical step um, in, in deep space exploration. Certainly, we've been to the moon. There are where there have been 12 people who have set foot on the moon, the last being uh, Eugene Cernan in 1972. Um, but at that time, the goal really was the space race. The goal really was, you know, as uh, has been said many times, flags and footprints. We wanted to get there faster than the Soviets. The Soviets were trying to get there too. Um, we just got there first and you know, spectacularly. Um, and uh, it, of course, spawned the space industry as we see it today. Um, but what we're trying to do now is to is to do more than to, to visit. The idea here is to be able to have a sustained presence. Um, and it's a great Apple uh, series that just came out uh, a couple of years ago. They're continuing it uh, called For All Mankind, which I definitely recommend to anybody um, uh, listening or watching right now. Um, it really gets and kind of plays out that scenario, it plays out a, a, an alternate history scenario, which I won't do any spoilers, but, uh, but the concept here is that um, we, um, do more of that sustaining of lunar presence um, earlier um, than, than we're currently talking about, really decades earlier. Uh, but it's a lot of the same ideas. We're trying to develop um, ultimately uh, commercial systems uh, with government demand initially uh, to be able to, to set um, a more permanent footprint uh, on the lunar surface. But to be able to do that though, um, similar to when we were first sending satellites up on orbit in the 60s, uh, and in the late 50s, um, there needed to be kind of a rules of the road for how we had different countries that were launching states would behave on orbit. And so there's the Outer Space Treaty, 19, 1967, there was the Liability Convention, there were uh, there was the Moon Treaty, which didn't have very many signatories, but um, this kind of gets back to that general concept of now that we're really talking about landing multiple landers on the moon, now that we're talking about potentially having space stations on the moon and perhaps an orbiter on the moon, um, with Lunar Gateway, for example, uh, with uh, you know, a lot of the different companies that are looking to land um, people and payloads on the moon, makes a lot of sense to make sure that we have some shared values and and, and kind of co uh, kind of a code of conduct uh, for when we land and operate on that lunar surface. 
Well, thank you so much, Raphael. This is a wonderful, wonderful presentation and such an interesting thank discussion. Thank you to everyone who asked questions, excellent questions. Um, I just want to give a nod to our, our um, technology expert, uh, Kathy Overton, who is behind the scenes. I don't know if you want to take a bow, Kathy, or if you have any final words, but um, she's made everything run very smoothly. Yeah, this this was great, Kathy. Alice, thank you for the great end scene and all the great questions um, and for the wonderful intro. Um, and, uh, and Kathy, this was, and I think we're kind of demoing use of this platform for Friends of the Planetarium. So let's let's keep using this. This is great. <laughs>